Hi everyone, it's Carrie Fridley, and for this module, we'll be learning about Bebop. Module 7, Bebop. By the end of the Second World War, jazz would experience a major change. Once the popular music of America, it would begin to transform into art music. The repetitive riffs and easily danceable rhythms of the big band era would soon give way to a more harmonically, melodically, and rhythmically advanced form of jazz. This new genre, known as bebop, would divide musical audiences into different camps. Some embraced the new style, praising it for its emphasis on extended improvisation, ornate melodic lines, adventurous rhythmic concepts, and instrumental virtuosity. The bebop fan viewed this music as finely aged wine, which only the most discerning and sophisticated listener could appreciate. By contrast, there were many who either did not understand bebop, choosing to ignore the new music, or lambast it altogether. This camp, which consisted of some of the most respected musicians of the day, attacked the new style. The beloved Louis Armstrong viewed bebop as a soulless series of musical exercises, the musicians performing routines which were musically out of context. Even Ralph Ellison, a prominent jazz essayist, who would later write the classic novel Invisible Man, viewed bebop as a violation of the very principles which established jazz as great music. His disapproval of Bird and Dizzy, nicknames for Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, shown here, amplifies the criticism bebop received from the public. He said, very often Dizzy and Bird were so engrossed with their experiments that they didn't provide enough music for the supportive rite of dancing. That bothered me. Ellison's critique accurately portrays the aesthetic of the bebop musician. This was music for musicians. One only has to observe the setting of the musical venue to understand this rebellious and at times antisocial aesthetic. The ballroom, a giant social setting for the swing era audience, emphasized a sense of community and interaction between the audience and the musicians where the, where the musicians had an obligation to provide the rhythms and catchy tunes which propelled the dancer's feet while bebop also fostered a sense of community and interaction it was very it was a very different model than what audiences might experience at the savoy ballroom the boppers had a selective almost elitist mentality which manifested itself both in their music and their performance attitude in swing music the large booming ballroom was a thriving temple where all were welcome in bebop, the tiny nightclub, cloaked in clandestine darkness, was an environment where there was little to no room for dancing. The limited seating of the nightclub's diminished size represented the bebop musician's desire to ignore the tastes of the audience and place the focus entirely on the sounds being produced on stage. Here we see Dennis Stock's famous photo of Miles Davis playing in a nightclub, which epitomizes the image of the modern jazz musician. But it would be inaccurate to portray bebop in this detached and distancing light. Yes, it was ex increasingly exclusive, but the newfound aloofness established by the boppers was simply a side effect of a more important mission, to explore the boundaries of what was possible in improvisation. 
the rich legacy of improvisation in jazz, hearkening all the way back to its origins in New Orleans, had been reduced to brief interludes in the swing music of the late 1930s and the early 1940s. The tightly arranged and strictly regulated scores of big band music left little room for personal expression, especially in the more popular dance bands, such as the Glenn Miller Orchestra. Indeed, most American audiences began to view jazz bands and dance or stage bands as one and the same, even when band leaders such as Glenn Miller publicly stated they were purveyors of dance music, not jazz. In an ironic sense, the boppers were responsible for reestablishing an element of community and interaction corrupted by the swing era. The emphasis on the community and interaction of the musicians may have turned off the majority of the American public, but it also captured the imagination of a smaller yet devout fan base of listeners who admired the boppers' commitment to artistic excellence, musical dialogue, and perhaps most importantly, expression through music. In this picture, we see Thelonious Monk standing outside of Minton's Playhouse with his musician friends, Howard McGee, Roy Eldridge, and Teddy Hill. They formed a small but dedicated nucleus of jazz musicians who first began to develop the bebop sound at Minton's Playhouse, which would host a jam on Mondays after the musicians had all been playing all weekend late into the night they could come to Minton's and be themselves. The bebop music was significant for revitalizing the essentiality of musical expression in jazz and the need to promote the voice of the artist over the demands of the public. The bebop musicians, no longer tied to their duty as providers of dance music, were free to explore new musical territory. No longer just accompanists to popular taste, the bebop musicians of the 1940s produced some of the most innovative music of the 20th century. All modern jazz owes a major debt to the pioneering efforts of the bebop musicians. As we will see in this module, jazz evolved by leaps and bounds, thanks to the groundbreaking genius of several boppers. Due to the limited scope of this survey course, however, we will focus on the contributions of three musicians, respectively. Charlie Parker, nicknamed Bird, Dizzy Gillespie, and Thelonious Monk. For a more in-depth understanding of the origins and evolution of bebop, you might want to read The Birth of Bebop, A Social and Musical History by Scott Knowles DeVoe. Few musicians have exerted as much influence over modern jazz as Charlie Parker or Bird. The intrepid alto saxophonist left an indelible mark on jazz. His contributions to the art form still are being felt today. Born in Kansas City in 1920, Parker was surrounded by a multitude of influences, including the blues pianists and early territory bands of his hometown. A major influence for the young saxophonist was Lester Young, whose sound and unique approach to improvisation would prove to be a pervasive element in Bird's own musical endeavors. As is so true of many great jazz artists, the young Bird had a difficult rise to success. It is easy to forget that this now esteemed giant of the jazz world was often ridiculed and discouraged during his early years as a musician. 
Always trying new sounds, Bird was often viewed by his elders and contemporaries as a musical pariah. At a jam session at the Reno Club in Kansas City in 1937, drummer Joe Jones of the Count Basie Band threw a cymbal at a 16-year-old bird. Annoyed by the saxophonist's unconventional modulation into a new key halfway through the form. Parker's unorthodox approach may have initially deterred many, but in time his unique approach would become widely emulated. Here's a picture of one of the bands in Kansas City that Charlie Parker played with. This is Jay McShann's band from 1938. An autodidact, Bird compensated for his lack of formal musical training by listening to everything and anything he could get his hands on. In addition to his love of Kansas City jazz, Parker would often play along with Benny Goodman, Ben Webster, and Coleman Hawkins' recordings. Parker was also a fan of classical music, notably modern composers such as Hindemith and Stravinsky. The latter composer was an especially major influence on Byrd. One legendary story tells of Parker quoting Stravinsky's Firebird Suite when the eminent Russian composer stopped into a New York nightclub to hear Parker perform. In spite of these musical homages, Byrd was largely his own individual. Parker would spend entire days practicing ornate, heavily embellished linear passages over famous jazz standards, weaving a perpetual tapestry of sound. Like the European composers of the Baroque era, centuries before him, Parker would take a simple melodic idea and create a multitude of complex variations. Combining his self-acquired knowledge of classical harmony with the blues tradition of Kansas City, Byrd developed an entirely new language, which would become the genre known as bebop. Like Big, Big Spiderbeck before him, Byrd emphasized the extensions to generate new implied harmonies and colorful melodic lines in the context of familiar songs. However, Byrd went beyond Beiderbeck, crafting entire musical phrases based on implied tonalities and harmonic progressions. The result was music that acquired that required an adventurous ear for both the performer and the listener. A result of these extended improvisations over familiar standards was a new type of musical composition. The contrafact was a model where a new melody was superimposed over the harmonic progressions for a familiar tune. Many of these contrafacts were collages of musical ideas Bird had formulated in his intense practice sessions coalesced seamlessly into a logically crafted musical work. There are important listening examples of these contrafacts that have since become a part of the standard repertoire for any serious jazz musician. These are listed in your textbook and I encourage you to listen to them intently. The first one is Ornithology and it is based on the standard How High the Moon. The next one is called Anthropology, and that one is based on the standard I've Got Rhythm. On Anthropology, the brisk tempo, which is over 340 beats per second, I mean per minute, over 340 beats per minute, does not deter Bird or Dizzy Gillespie from crafting logical and exhilarating solos, showcasing the virtuosity of both musicians.
Bird was also a master of expanding the possibilities of tried and true musical forms in the jazz idiom, most notably the blues. Having existed since the birth of jazz, this 12-bar form, which we went over in Module 2, would undergo a major transformation in the creative hands of Parker. Always exploring and searching for new ways to approach old material, Parker developed a new type of blues, often referred to simply as bird blues, where additional chords were inserted in between the larger harmonic pillars of the 12-bar form. The result is astounding and a testimony to Parker's genius as an improviser. Bird transformed the original three-chord structure into a harmonically rich soundscape, adding 12 new chords, implying five new keys, all in the space of 12 measures of music. So here you see the music, the chord chart for Blues for Alice, which is a composition that has since become a required work for any student of jazz. Now, if you're not used to reading music, take a listen to the recording of Blues for Alice and see if you can hear the expanded harmonic language. Like many of the jazz musicians we will study, Parker, an introspective and brilliant artist, often misunderstood by others, turned to heroin as a means of coping with the pain. From the age of 16 until his death, Bird had a troubled relationship with heroin and alcohol, abusing both frequently. Ultimately, this resulted in Bird's cabaret card being revoked in 1954. Sadly, at a time in the musician's career when he was finally receiving the widespread recognition he had sought after for his entire musical life. When you lose your cabaret card, you can no longer work in the clubs in New York. Here's a picture of Charlie Parker near the end of his career with a young Miles Davis. Charlie Parker, one of the greatest musicians in the history of jazz, died at the age of 34 in 1955. The cause of death was an ulcer, something which could have easily been prevented had Byrd not insisted on avoiding hospital care. The toll of heroin and alcohol abuse was visually apparent at the time of Parker's passing, his death certificate listing the saxophonist's age as somewhere between 50 and 60 years old. Parker's tragic and untimely passing left many to wonder what would become of jazz music. Fortunately, a new school of musicians who had studied Bird would carry on his legacy, and two of the saxophonist's contemporaries and close musical collaborators, Dizzy Gillespie and Thelonious Monk, would carry the torch of bebop following Bird's passing. This is Dizzy Gillespie, seen here with his idiosyncratic bent trumpet, his trademark. Dizzy Gillespie, often referred to as Dizzy, like his close friend and musical comrade Charlie Parker, was a hugely influential and progressive jazz musician of the bebop era. The two musicians possessed different personalities. Bird was introspective, moody, somewhat aggressive, and had little interest in his public image. By stark contrast, Gillespie was charismatic, with a cheerful disposition and a powerful stage presence. Dizzy's showmanship was largely, largely a result of his stint with the hugely popular vocalist and band leader Cab Calloway 
who embodied the principles of an entertainer in every sense of the word. Gillespie once stated, Playing with cab, I was always doing my damnedest to be hip. The classic image of the hip jazz musician with a beret, stylish suit and tie, and cool, restrained demeanor are largely a result of Gillespie's attention to image. However, Dizzy's musicianship, compositions, and innovative crossing of musical genres is truly what makes him one of the giants of jazz history. A trumpet player of unparalleled virtuosity, Dizzy was unique in that he not only possessed technical facility and speed on his horn, but also demonstrated a mastery of music theory, harmony, and melodic ingenuity. Few musicians were at the same level as Gillespie, Parker being one of them. The two played frequently in late night jam sessions at Minton's, a club in Harlem, New York, pushing the boundaries of what was musically possible in jazz in the 1940s. Both Parker and Gillespie would take extended solos building entire musical phrases off of chord extensions, pushing the tempo to lightning speed, and playing in rarely performed keys so as to discourage less experienced players from sitting in. This process of musical selection, where Parker and Gillespie separated the wheat from the chaff, may seem divisive and rude. However, it was this very selective attitude that allowed both musicians to push jazz in new directions. Gillespie, always searching for new sounds and new ideas, was a pioneer in the bebop mu movement in several regards. He was the first bebop musician to form a bebop big band something he hoped would garner the often misunderstood genre to a new audience. He also was an early pioneer in the development of Q-bop, a syncretic style where the traditional yet complex polyrhythms of Afro-Cuban music were fused with the melodic sophistication of bebop. The resulting musical offspring was something the world had never heard before, an infectiously catchy form of dance music that still offered the soloists enough room to improvise in the bebop language. A key element in the forging of this new genre was the inclusion of traditional Cuban instruments, notably the congas. Barrel-shaped hand drums played in pairs or groups of three. Chano Pazo, a virtuoso of the congas, or master conguero, was a significant musical collaborator with Dizzy. Tragically, Pazo was murdered in Harlem after only working for a year with Gillespie, but their music caught the attention of the public. Two of Gillespie's most famous and influential works, which would set the stage for a larger Latin jazz culture, can be heard in the listening link in your textbook for Manteca. This picture is when Dizzy Gillespie went to Cuba to visit and listen to music. Be sure to listen to Manteca and also Con Alma, which is another listening link listed in your textbook, played by Dizzy Gillespie's big band. Con Alma is an especially notable example of Gillespie's mastery as a composer. The simplicity of the opening melody in the A section is juxtaposed against a drifting backdrop of beautifully cascading chords over a hypnotic bolero rhythm. 
a single note transformed subtly by the underlying harmonies. This tune showcases Gillespie's versatility and how he was able to transform even the simplest musical ideas into a memorable yet complex framework for improvisation. While Dizzy was certainly significant as an innovator in creating the Q-bop genre, he was equally influential as a composer and performer in the bebop idiom as well. Many standard bebop tunes, which have since become standards, were penned by Gillespie, including Groovin' High and his more humorous Salt Peanuts, a deceptively simple number that also showcases Dizzy's harmonic knowledge and virtuosic prowess. If you listen in your textbook to Groovin' High, listen to the melody that starts eight seconds in with Gillespie's trumpet. Now, Salt Peanuts was the first single that Dizzy and Bird put out together. And the soldiers heard this on the radio as they were coming home from World War II, and they loved it. So be sure to listen to Salt Peanuts in your textbook. This picture shows Diz later in life, and you can see how he doesn't follow the rules. You're not supposed to let your cheeks puff out when you play the trumpet. That's what you learn in band class. But Dizzy was self-taught, and he always puffed out his cheeks like that. It's one way you can tell it's Diz in the picture. Thelonious Monk, the high priest of Bop. Here he is at the piano. Credit is often given to Parker and Gillespie for their contributions to Bebop, but one figure, Thelonious Monk, is sometimes overlooked. This is not surprising since much of Monk's commercial success did not happen until 1951 when the pianist began assiduously recording his music from the early 1950s through the early 1960s. However, Monk was one of the founding figures in the bebop genre. He also stands out as one of the most unique and influential pa pianists in the history of jazz. The youngest of the three musicians mentioned in this module Monk was born in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, about 300 miles east of Asheville. In 1939, Monk secured the position as the house pianist at Minton's, collaborating with Bird and Gillespie through the 1940s and helping to develop the bebop sound. Monk was often derided as an incapable player, largely due to his unorthodox style of playing, which embraced jagged syncopation, percussive attacks at the keyboard, and unconventional chord voicings and harmonic progressions. Monk has the most instantly recognizable style of any jazz pianist in history. His often pointillist and even aggressive approach immediately capturing the listener's attention. But Monk's true genius and the skill that established him as a giant of jazz music was his abilities as a composer. Monk's diverse oeuvre is widely performed forming a significant staple of the modern jazz musician's repertoire. Whether it was a simple 12-bar blues or a more expansive ballad, Monk wrote melodies that were instantly memorable while retaining atypical traits, including unpredictable dissonances and angular contours. This unique approach made Monk a musical outsider for much of the 1940s, while Parker and Gillespie were gradually gaining recognition for their contributions to bebop. 
Monk struggled to find work. Aside from a few notable stints with Coleman, Hawkins, and Dizzy Gillespie's big bands, Monk was largely viewed as an anomaly by the jazz community. The pianist's first recordings as a band leader for the Blue Note label in 1947 and 1948 were critically lambasted. One reviewer for Downbeat magazine criticized Monk, suggesting he, pay, he played bad, though interesting, piano, and even going so far as to say that Monk fingers around trying to get over the technical inadequacies of his own playing. The irony is that many of the compositions recorded on these albums would go on to become classic masterpieces in the jazz canon. A true artist, Monk persisted with his musical vision and was ultimately rewarded. A decade after being ridiculed by the majority of the jazz press, Monk found himself a superstar in the jazz world. On November 29, 1957, Monk, along with saxophone superstar John Coltrane, recorded Thelonious Monk Quartet with John Coltrane at Carnegie Hall. In 1958 and 1959, the same magazine, which had ridiculed Monk ten years earlier, awarded the pianist first place in the critics poll. On February 28, 1964, Monk made the cover of Time magazine with a feature story on the pianist and composer. Like Duke Ellington before him, Monk achieved a very difficult thing for any jazz musician or for that matter any artist. He was able to achieve success and fame as a musician without compromising his artistic vision. While the journey had been difficult, Monk ultimately achieved a level of success and popularity unrivaled by the other beboppers. To learn more about this giant of jazz, you might want to read Chris Sheridan's A Bio Discography of Thelonious Monk which provides information on Monk's life as well as information to the pianist composer's, composer's best recordings. Now we're going to look at a small sample of Monk's brilliant and diverse compositional output. The first one I'd like you to listen to is perhaps his most famous, Monk's haunting and introspective ballad, Round Midnight which has been covered by everyone from Miles Davis to Bobby McFerrin. The second one I'd like you to listen to is called I Mean You, with vibraphonist Milt Jackson, who we will study later in the course. It is indicative of Monk's pointillistic approach. And then next, Monk's Mood from the 1957 Carnegie Hall recording with John Coltrane. This showcases a beautiful side of Monk's playing, joy and anguish juxtaposed in a miniature tone poem, showcasing the composer's revolutionary approach to harmony and melody. There is an almost symphonic quality to the music. Monk evokes the sound of an orchestra from his keystrokes at the piano in certain moments. So look in your textbook for the listening links for Round Midnight, I Mean You, and Monk's Mood. Glossary, bebop, musical genre which developed in the early 1940s emphasizing extended improvisation, ornate melodic lines, adventurous rhythmic concepts, and instrumental virtuosity. Bolero, a slow dance genre of Cuban music, 
It can be heard in Dizzy Gillespie's composition, Con Alma. Changes. Harmonic progression of constantly changing chords, which act as an underlying structural device for the improviser. Congas. Large barrel shaped hand drums used in Afro-Cuban music often appearing in pairs or groups of three. Contrafact. A new melody is superimposed over the harmonic progression for a familiar tune. Significant people. Cab Calloway, vocalist and band leader, Charlie Parker, alto saxophonist, composer, Chano Pazo, Conguero, Dizzy Gillespie, trumpeter, composer, Thelonious Monk, pianist, composer, and Ralph Ellison, American novelist, jazz writer, and essayist. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time.